you guys, Amelia here. So today's video is a recording of a live Zoom call that I did all about dressage competition and test riding. So we go deep into what's expected at each level, how the judge comes up with the scores, the coefficients, the collective marks, and then some tips for your warm up, some do's and don'ts for competition day. So I really hope that you enjoy this lecture. Also, check out the link below. I have three master classes on the level. So I have a master class on training level, a master class on first level, and a master class on second level. And in these master classes, we dive deep into each individual level. I ride through all the tests and all the exercises and help you understand how to train these exercises and really how to get ready for your competition at each of those levels. And you will get 10% off for this show season of 2021. The other thing that's super cool about these master classes is at the end, you can film yourself riding through a test, submit to me your video, and I will score it and send you back comments. So I hope you enjoy this lecture. All right, so dressage competition and test riding. Thank you all for being here today. And I wanted to make this presentation for one that it's, um, if you don't wanna compete, it's totally fine. I have a lot of students and a lot of people that ride and love their horses and don't compete. And that's like absolutely fine. There's still a lot that you can learn by looking through the tests and understanding the different levels and how the tests are designed. And you can get a lot of great exercises to work on riding and training, even if you don't compete. So not competition isn't for everyone and that's totally fine. I love training too. Okay, I wanted to start out with this uh, little poem by Jeff Foster, which actually my mother sent me. Courage is your willingness to not know, to speak your truth, to walk your path, to face ridicule and rejection, to keep going despite the voices in your head and the judgments of others. And there are no guarantees you will make it. Nobody can walk for you. You walk in radical aloneness, naked, in the face of life, no protection, no crutches, no external authority, no ideology to save you, no promises anymore. Only the beating of the heart and the air in the lungs and the thrill and terror of being utterly free and no longer numb. And a knowing from deep within and the call of your ancestors and the ground holding you and the sun warming you and the fragrance of love everywhere and warm tears running down your cheeks, and this gorgeous vulnerability which makes you unbreakable. So I wanted to start with this poem because so much of showing and putting yourself out there is just that. It's being vulnerable and it's like just that vulnerability. I love the last sentence that makes you unbreakable. So even though it's painful and you might fail and you're gonna get criticized, you got to kind of take that leap and put yourself out there and that's how you grow and get better and have an achievement, achieve something. So thank you for sharing that mom. So we're going to start out with, um, I know all of you guys are at different levels and that's great. I wanted to kind of focus on mostly training first, second and a little bit third. Um, but a lot of the stuff goes with all the levels. So some of you guys are from other countries. So I wanted to talk about in the US, we have four levels. Well, I guess five. We have training level, first level, second level, third level, and fourth level. Those tests are made by USDF. So those are only in the United States are those tests. In the US, those tests, we get a new test every four years. After fourth level, we have the FEI level. So after fourth level, we have pre-St. George, I1, I2, and Grand Prix. Those tests are international tests. So those are the same tests that people ride in Europe and around the country. So just to clarify that, we're gonna mainly be focusing on the lower levels 
if you are not in the US, which give me a comment if you're not from the US, because I love to hear where you guys are from, you will have different tests for the lower levels, but they are similar. So you can still get a lot out of this discussion. You may just need to adapt it a little bit based on your test. Oh yeah, we have someone in the Netherlands, hello. Um, someone in Mexico and Canada. I don't know about Canada. I guess you guys probably have different tests. Okay, we have someone from Spain, hi Mark. Okay, so we're starting with training level. And what you'll notice when you look up, like say you're gonna ride training level test one, when you look up that test, you'll see in the top left-hand corner, it will say the purpose of training level. You should read that. So the purpose of training level is to confirm that the horse demonstrates correct basics, is supple and moves freely forward in steady rhythm with a steady tempo, accepting contact with the bit. All the trot work may be ridden sitting or rising unless stated, and halts may be ridden through the walk. So you'll see that written on the top corner of your training level test. Um, you'll notice that training level, the purpose basically focuses on the bottom part of the training scale, which we talked about a few weeks ago. So rhythm, they want to see a clear four beat walk, two beat trot, three beat canter. Suppleness, which relates to remember relaxation and the ability for the horse's muscles to stretch and contract. And then connection, which talks about the acceptance of the aid. So you'll see the purpose is accepting contact with the bit, which when our horse is accepting contact, it means that they're not hiding, nor are they pulling. So I always think of contact should be like, if you're holding your kid's hand and you're crossing the street, you know, you have a feel of their hand, but you're not like, crushing their hands. So that's when I think of the contact that I want to feel with the bit, that's how it should feel and it should be movable. So um, trot work can be ridden rising or sitting. So in general at training level, I prefer rising trot because usually at training level, you're riding a little bit more of a green horse or you're a green rider. It's the introduction to dressage. Rising trot allows the horse a little more freedom in their back. And I just think it's, for me, easier for most of my horses. If you really feel more comfortable sitting, which you might if your horse is tense or something, then go ahead and sit. But it's nice that they give you that option. Um, if you guys have any questions, you can write me questions. Oh yeah, so Canada does use the USEF test. So this should apply to Canada. So moving on to first level. So in first level, things get a bit more complicated and the levels build upon each other. So the purpose of first level is to confirm that the horse demonstrates correct basics. So basics are everything in dressage. Even when I'm riding my Grand Prix horse, I start out the ride every day with training and first level movement. So 20 meter circles, trot canter trot transitions, leg yields. It's not like once you do the upper levels, you just forget the lower levels. Dressage really builds on itself. Um, so in addition to the requirements at training level has developed thrust to achieve, to achieve improved balance and throughness and maintains a more consistent contact with the bit. So thrust, let's talk about thrust. When we talk about thrust, they're referring to the pushing power from the hind legs. At first level, you have lengthening trot and lengthening canter. What they wanna see in lengthening trot and canter is basically that the strides get longer and more suspension, more impulsion. Remember that word impulsion from the training scale? so that there's more suspension and more air time. Um, in a lengthening trot or canter, the frame does get a little longer, um, but then you also have to be able to compress that frame after the lengthening. 
You'll also notice if you look down here, you can get a lot of information by looking at your tests. So you see here on the left, you see the purpose of first level. Then you'll also see that small red circle I circled introduce. So at first level test three, you're introducing a 10 meter circle at trot. You're introducing a change of lead through the trot and you're introducing counter canner. The tests are really, really well designed where every new test you introduce a few new things. So even again, even if your goal isn't to show, maybe look at a test and find some little patterns that you want to start practicing because the tests are designed to help you train your horse. Now, I also wanted to talk about the directives. So um, that's the big bottom red circle here. And again, you can get so much information by just reading your test. So first we have our halt. The directive tells you exactly what the judge is looking for so that you can get a good mark. So they're looking for regularity and quality of the trot. So do you have a nice forward trot? Um, willing and clear transitions. Do you go nicely and smoothly from trot to halt and then back to trot? Um, straightness, are you straight on the center line? Attentiveness, so when you halt, your horse should stay somewhat on the bit. They shouldn't just stick their head up and look around. This can be really a challenge on a young horse. And sometimes it's one of those things that you just have to give a little. Um, maybe let your horse look a little until they get more relaxed. Immobility, so your horse needs to stand still for a minimum of three seconds. So I'm not gonna go through all of this, but whatever level or test you're planning on doing, print out your test, read the purpose, and read the directives because you can get a lot of information out of just that you know, where we maybe don't have a trainer or we're not working with a trainer all the time, be your own teacher, be your own student and look at what the judge is looking for. Um, okay. Yes, thank you, mom. Yeah, you can find these tests online. So just Google training level test three and it'll pop up. Make sure it's the 2019 version because we got new tests last year in 2019. So you don't wanna learn the 2015 version or you're gonna have a problem in the show ring. Okay, so second level is where we introduce collection. And you know, a lot of horses get stuck and riders between first level and second level. So if you look at the um, if you look at the purpose of second level to confirm that the horse demonstrates correct basics and having achieved the thrust required at first level now accepts more weight on the hindquarters, which is collection, moves with an uphill tendency, especially in the medium gates, and is reliably on the bit a greater degree of straightness, bending, suppleness, throughness, balance, and self-carriage is required than at first level. Um, let me mute this person. Okay, so you can see second level, suddenly the purpose has gotten much more complicated because we now have collection. When we look at the training scale, now suddenly at second level, we need to be thinking about all these levels of the training scale. So as we're doing our second level test, we have to now have collection, straightness, impulsion, connection, suppleness, and rhythm. So it gets really complicated. Um, second level, we have walk canter walk transitions. We have collected trot and collected canter is introduced at second level. Whereas at first level, we had working trot and working canner. We also have shoulder in, haunches in, rein back, uh, turn on the haunches are all introduced, um, counter canner at second level. So that's a fun, a fun level to get to, but also a challenging level. Third level, again, is you see this kind of the same thing. You see the purpose. 
um, which is basically everything from second level, but now demonstrates increased engagement, um, especially in the extended gates. So in second level, you had medium gates. In third level, you have extended gates. So and it, the difference between a medium and extended is I just think of it as more. In an extended trot, you have overstep, which means that the horse's frame extends. And also, um, when you see the, the hind footprint has to go past the footprint of the front. So basically, extended just means more engagement, more length in the stride, more everything. You also, at third level, have flying changes. So that's another big hurdle. Um, as far as teaching your horse. And in general, it's about a level a year. So if you're really working hard and training five days a week, you can go up one level per year. Dressage is a really slow sport. If, you, if you're stuck at the same level for a few years, it's okay. Like you, there's a lot to work on clearly. So don't rush it. It takes a long time. So the scoring. So when you ride your test, each movement will get a score from zero to 10. Most of the scores are, I would say, between like five and seven or eight. That's where the ballpark of most of your scores are gonna be. You can get half points also. So you can get a 6.5 or a 7.5. And you can see here, this is basically what the judges use to decide. If you're getting a six, that's considered satisfactory. So if you're getting a 60%, that's like a passing grade. So it's a little different than like in school, if you're getting a 60%, um, you're failing. But in dressage, a 60%, you're good. I remember when I was a kid, and I would get 60%, I would be so happy because that was a qualifying score. Okay, uh, oh, Janice has a question. How is the best way at second level and above to create the correct on the bit quality without getting the neck too short and tight? Okay, Janice, that's a good question. Um, and this a little bit depends on the horse. Some horses have like shorter necks than others and tend to curl. Um, the best thing that I think is that it's always as you're collecting your horse and bringing your horse up into a second or a third level frame, it's about the engagement of the hind legs. So if your horse is getting too short in the neck, you need to think about engaging that hind leg. So like riding shoulder in and then letting the neck get a little longer because you've engaged the hind leg. There's this feeling of like when you tuck the hind leg under, you can make the neck longer. So if you can tuck that inside hind leg under and make the neck longer to the outside rein, that feeling is going to help get the horses to um, get a little longer in the neck and not just curl. Okay, collective marks. So in training through fourth level, you have at the end of your test, you get five collective marks from the judge. And at the FEI levels, you only get one score. At the end of your test, you only get a rider score, which I think is kind of a shame because the collective marks are really kind of a general impression of your test. And like, um, I think it's really important just that general feel of your ride. You know, was it harmonious? Was it rhythmic? Are you on the right track? That's what these scores are about. Um, so gates. Um, in the gate score, the judge is basically assessing the quality of the gate. So the walk, trot, and canter, and is it for, you know, is your horse trotting for a six or a seven or an eight? That's how they come up with that score. Um, the gate score, I like that it's not a coefficient. You see it's only multiplied by one. 
because gates are sometimes, you know, you can enhance the quality of your horse's gates, but some horses just have better gates than others. And there's not a lot you can do about that. Now the second score is impulsion. So you'll see my nice little picture here of Natasha. Impulsion is your engine. So impulsion is the back end of the horse. So impulsion, the desire to move forward, elasticity of the steps, suppleness of the back, engagement of the hindquarters. Um, and these collective marks are the same for training up through fourth level, which I think is a little, you know, I don't know that in training level, there's a lot of engagement of the hindquarters, but they're the same. So when we're thinking about impulsion, that the ba judge is basically deciding, was your horse forward? Was your horse engaged? Um, was your horse elastic? Were, were they tight in the back? That's all the things that's going to affect your impulsion score. And it is a coefficient. So that score is multiplied by two. So if you have a test where your horse is lazy or they don't do an upward transition, or they don't show enough difference in the lengthening trots, that's gonna go down in your impulsion score. Um, There's what? a question, Amelia. Yeah. It's about when you're first starting, how do you know when you're getting impulsion? And what training exercises teach impulsion? Okay, that's a good question. Um, so we talked last week about transitions. Transitions are a great way to work on impulsion. Um, also, a few weeks ago, we talked about the training scale. So impulsion is that moment of suspension in your horse's step. So it's the moment where all four feet are off the ground. Um, it's the desire to move forward. So it's that feeling that when you put your leg on, your horse is going. Um, but basically the best exercise to work on impulsion is your transitions and really what we talked about last week. So submission is the front half of that horse. If you look at the picture here, the blue circle is circling the front end of the horse and that's basically what submission score is, is willing cooperation, harmony, attention and confidence, acceptance of the bit, straightness, lightness of the forehand and ease of movements. Um, so if you have a ride, which we've all had bad rides, where your horse is really distracted and not focusing on you, your submission score is going to go down. So I have a story on this. I was showing my horse Trump at the LA Equestrian Center and when I was going around the edge of the arena, Trump like reared and squealed. And then in my test, he started bucking and the judge asked me if I wanted to finish my ride. And I was so upset and frustrated and I was so mad. I said, yes, I want to finish my ride. Um, but that's an example of obviously where I got a very low submission score because I did not have a willing and cooperative horse. So if you guys have a submission story that you want to sh share, feel free in the comments. Um, but that's showing. Sometimes it's not your day and you've just got to be determined and stick with it and keep doing it. Sometimes, you know, your submission will be great at home and you get to the show and it all goes badly. Okay, the last two um, collective marks are rider position and seat. So this is so important always to keep in mind um, the alignment, posture, stability, weight placement, following mechanics of the gait. Um, so alignment is pretty self-explanatory. Now weight placement, it's interesting that they have that here and it is really important about where you place your weight. So the judge doesn't want to see you leaning in or out or tipping forward or back. They also really want to see in the, like in second level and above, when you're riding a lateral movement, so a shoulder in or a haunches in or a half pass, 
you should have more weight on your inside seat bone. So that's a little bit what that's talking about there. Um, Dottie says the distribution of the weight on the seat bones. Yes, that too. Um, and then the rider's correct and effective use of the aids. So clarity, subtlety, independence, and accuracy of the test. And again, it's like you have to look pretty, but you also have to be effective. And when you're riding a test, you need to ride it accurately. So looking up, looking for your letters, doing the right thing at the right letter is what the judge is looking for. So that's super important. Um, okay, transition. So this is a slide from last week. We already talked about this a little bit, but that your transitions are really, really expensive in your test. So this test here is training level test three. Nine of the 15 movements are transitions. All of the transitions are circled in red. And you'll also notice that some of the transitions are uh, coefficients. So you'll see a two times mark for your can or trot transition, that transition is worth double. So transitions are very heavily weighted in training level and then all the way up to the Grand Prix. So I hope you guys practice those from last week. Um, let's see, we have some questions. Is there a way to remember why we weight our seat bone on a particular side? That's a good question. Um, you weight your inside seat bone because it puts your weight over the horse's center of gravity. In a shoulder in right or a 10 meter circle right or a half pass right, your horse's center of gravity is slightly more to the inside because they're bending to the right. So your center of gravity needs to be over the horse's center of gravity, which is slightly to the inside. So that is a great question. Thank you. Okay, ride your corners. So corners are a really important part of test riding because the corners are where you set up for your next movement. So whether you're doing a lengthening trot or across the diagonal or a canter transition, at training level, um, the trot canter transition is always done in a corner. So corners are a great time to remember to bend your horse, remember to half halt your horse, remember to breathe, take your time in your corners because it really sets you up for the next movement. Um, and when you're riding a Grand Prix, it's even, even more important. If you have a bad corner before your line of one tempies, you are in big trouble. So start now practicing your corners. You will, if your horse is very green and unbalanced, you don't go as deep into the corners. So a training level corner is kind of like a, maybe a half of a, or a quarter of a 10 meter or a 15 meter circle. You don't go so deep in the corners, but as you go up the levels, you ride deeper and deeper into the corners because your horse is more collected, more bendable, more engaged and um, so that's kind of the progression. At training level, especially in the canner, you don't really go into the corners because your horse is probably not very balanced and that's okay. Um, but in training level, in the trot and the walk, go more into your corners than you do at the canner. That's my advice on corners. If anyone has any questions, they can write me a question. Okay, preparation and visualization. That's a tongue twister there. If you guys have anything you wanna to add to this list, this is just like very minimal, but um, I've shown, God, I don't even know. I've shown hundreds of horses. I've ridden hundreds of tests and the preparation really makes a difference. So the do's, one is make sure you can ride your test from start to finish at home before you enter the test. 
Um, don't think that on show day, like suddenly the performance gods are going to come to you and your horse is going to be perfect and you're going to be able to get through the test. You have to be able to ride through it at home first because it's always worse at the show. It just is. Um, the second one is memorize your test. Even if you're going to have a reader, it's really, really important to memorize your test because for one, you need to be able to give your horse confidence about what's coming up next. And often with a reader, you maybe can't hear them or they don't read the movement soon enough and it's just not good. So my advice is to memorize your test. Um, oh, this is a good question. Someone asked, is it okay to let my horse memorize the test closer to show day? So thank you for asking this. Um, yes and no, that's kind of a catch 22 because it's like you do want your horse to kind of know what's coming, but you don't want your horse to start anticipating so much that they're not listening to you. So if, if your horse is kind of good in that they'll, they'll know what's coming, but they're not going to start anticipating, then yeah, let your horse kind of start knowing what's coming. But I do little things when I'm practicing my test, like I don't always halt at X, I'll halt past X. Or, you know, if my horse is anticipating the canter transition, I won't do it. So yes and no, you do want your horse to kind of know what's coming up, but you don't want them to take over because that's not good. Um, have a mistake plan. So let's say for example, that your horse might not take the left lead canter. It's important to visualize, like visualize what it's gonna feel like and your horse is gonna take the left lead canter. But you also have to have a plan for if something goes badly. So let's say they don't take the left lead canter. What are you going to do? Um, you want to, as quickly as you can, go back to the trot and then pick that canter up again. That's my advice. But it's important to don't just visualize everything going perfectly. You know, what might happen? And how can you be ahead of that and help your horse? Or let's say if your horse maybe is going to spook in one corner, you know, you're going to be bending your horse, riding your horse in shoulder in, um, and helping your horse pass that scary area. Um, and then another big thing is I always try to go the day before and school my horse in the show ring. I know that this isn't always possible for everyone. But if you can do it, it makes a huge difference. And all of the top riders, like the FEI riders, they are schooling in the show ring before competition day. None of them go down the center line with their horse never seeing that arena before. Um, let's see, what else? Okay, don't. Don't just ride your test over and over again. This is really important. Um, that you kind of like what I'll do is say, I'll start my test. And if something goes wrong, like if there's a transition I don't like, I'm repeating that transition. If my horse isn't quite ready to do something, I'll make a circle and do it again. Sometimes I see people that just practice their test over and over again, and then they're just practicing mistakes and they're practicing bad quality. And that really isn't helpful. So, when you're practicing at home, kind of, you know, work on segments of the test, maybe work on like the right lead canner, but be willing to practice and repeat it and don't just let your horse get away with doing it badly because that really is not going to help you. Um, okay, if you know for a fact that your horse is going to spook or not listen, is there a way to minimize the loss of points by doing something to work through the spook or is that cheating? Um, that's a good question. And a little bit, it depends. Sometimes like if I know my horse is really afraid of one corner, I'll kind of cut the corner a little bit off and keep the horse in a little shoulder in or maybe ride my transition a little bit early. So yeah, there are ways to minimize it 
and like cheat a little, the judge might say, you know, inaccurate or you cut your corner, but sometimes it's better to like cut a little bit in and give your horse confidence and get the transition to happen rather than saying, you know, I'm going into the corner and they spook and run backwards and have a big blow up. So thank you for that question. Okay, another, don't, oh, someone has a question? There's another really good question in there, which is how do you decide when to move up the levels? Is there a certain score that you recommend before you change levels? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I mean, definitely 60%. Like you for sure need to get a 60% before you go to the next level. I would say it's better if you're getting like a 65 is in general better to be moving up the levels. I always recommend that you are schooling a level higher than you're showing. So if you're schooling second level, you're showing first level. And that's really important because you want to give yourself and your horse confidence in the show ring. That's my next thing. Don't overface you and your horse. If you go in at too high of a level and get, um, you know, a terrible score and your horse gets discouraged and you get discouraged, that's not going to go well. So it's much better to show a little lower level where you can have a positive experience and get a better score. And it's also better for your horse because horses know the difference. They start to know when it's show day. and if you traumatize them in the show ring, that's a really hard thing to work on and get rid of. Um, don't start the ride with a negative mindset. I've done this, like there was a show last year, I remember, and the judge was so tough and just, um, she was giving really low scores and being negative about everything. And it got to me and it got to my mind and it affected my whole show basically because I was just thinking about the, how horrible my score is gonna be and nothing was going well. So I've done this thing since then where when I ride down the center line, I remind myself like, I'm proud to be here. I love my horse. I'm gonna make the best of this and just kind of get myself pumped up and positive and you know, we show for fun. So if it's not fun, if you're not enjoying it, if you're not proud, then it's just not, it's not worth doing. Um, also, don't forget to salute with your whip in your hand or don't salute with your whip in your hand. I should be more clear about that. So if you're gonna salute, make sure that you put your whip um, in your other hand. Don't salute with your whip in your hand. So. Let's say your whip is in your right hand. When you go to salute, put your whip and your other rein, everything in your left hand. You don't have to switch your whip over, but just make sure that you don't keep the whip in your hand because when you put your hand out, you might accidentally hit your horse. And also the judges really don't like to see that. Also, don't forget to take off your boots. I forgot to take off my bell boots once for a Grand Prix test and got eliminated. It was very embarrassing. No, no, that was me that forgot to take off your well, boots. Well, I take the blame <laughs> because I was the rider, so it was my responsibility. <laughs> There's another question over here, which I like, which is what is the most nervous you have ever been and how did you get through it? Oh God, the most nervous, most nervous I've ever been is when I used to have to do clarinet recitals. I hated those. <laughs> um, but I do get nervous sometimes. I don't really get so nervous when I'm riding. My best advice though, is that breathing, like we talked about in that, in the fear webinar, just really taking deep breaths and exhaling and then also don't be afraid of nerves because nerves and that adrenaline are like excitement and being excited and proud. And you have to channel it into that, like wanting to do well and like accept your nervousness because I get nervous 
but I also, when I show is like when I ride the best and when my horses go the best and when I have the best moments with my horse. So just like take it and go with it and make the best of it. Don't try to um, like make like you're not nervous, just go with it. That's my best advice. Um, do you always salute with the right hand? Yes, you are supposed to salute with the right hand. Let's see, what is you, Janice asked, what is your opinion on bling in the show ring? Coats and boots other than black and thoughts on wave jack, jackets. Um, good question, Janice. I, um, I mean, I like a little bling. I think that that's just kind of up to whatever people want. I like black or blue jackets. I don't really like the red or the maroon, but it's up to you guys. I mean, I'm not, I think that's the least of our worries. If you want to wear a maroon jacket, go for it. Um, waved jackets, that's a good one. So in general, if you get really hot, and the jackets are waved, don't wear a jacket because it's just not worth it for you to get heat stroke or to have a bad ride because you're wearing your jacket. Um, I, in general, wear my jacket, but I also have, you can get jackets that are really nice, lightweight material that's not so hot, which is what I have for my show jackets. With my students though, I tell them just don't wear a jacket because it's one less thing to worry about. And unless you're, you know, in the Olympics or in a big like year end competition, it doesn't affect your score. And if it allows you to ride better, then just don't wear a jacket. Um, okay, the warm up. So the warm up is really, really important part of having a good show and it's important the most important thing that I want to tell you guys about the warm-up is that for one do the same thing you do at home so if you you know follow the format that you do at home if you usually get on and walk for five or ten minutes and do some leg yields and start your horse lower do that in the warm-up um, don't change everything on show day because your horse is going to be like really confused and worried and it's just horses are creatures of habit so the more that it can just be like a normal day that's the most important thing um the other thing i want to tell you about the warm-up is don't think that on show day you're gonna train your horse. Like if your horse isn't trained before the show, you're not gonna train them in the warm up. I see sometimes people that, you know, it comes show day and suddenly they decide to teach their horse to leg yield, it's too late. So you have to go to the show with enough confidence in the training that you have at home that your warm up can be focused on getting your horse relaxed, getting your horse on the aids, all of that, and not worried about like, oh, you know, I haven't trained my horse and today I'm going to train my horse. My other advice is that in the warm up, so after I do my relaxing work and I get my horse on the aids, I school a little bit what's in the test. So um, let's say I'm riding second level and I have counter canner. I'm going to school a little bit the counter canner um, in my warm up. Um, I'm not going to school a flying change. So don't school stuff in the warm up that's not in your test. That's really important because whatever you do in the warm up, the horse is going to think they should do in the arena. So if you're doing first or second level where you have counter canner, do not school changes in the warm up because your horse may do a flying change in the show arena. Um, the other thing is just keep reminding yourself to breathe and relax because your horse is going to be a little tense. You're probably going to be in a new venue and you're going to be tense. So just you're the bigger person, like we talked about in the fear webinar breathing, lowering your center of gravity. 
if you have someone there helping you, have them remind you, like breathe, relax, enjoy this, be proud of your horse, this is for fun. All that stuff is really important. Um, okay, let me go back here. Another thing that I wanted to just talk about, and I think this happens a lot, is that people are so worried about what people on the sidelines are going to say and kind of the peanut gallery and you know what people are saying about them if something bad happens i have been around some of the best riders and best trainers in dressage and i'll tell you that everyone that is at the top of this sport is very understanding of having a bad day or having your horse spook or having a bad ride. Anyone who's competed and done well has had a bad ride and had things go badly in the show ring. And no one that I've met that's a good rider sits on the sidelines and bad mouths people or criticizes people that are in the show ring. So that's my advice and don't do it to other people it's really hard showing. It's scary to put yourself out there. You know, my advice is just ignore anyone that's critical of you because they're not out there doing it. And if they were, if they were a true horseman, they wouldn't be doing it. So that's a little, sorry, I went off on a little tangent there, but I think that's really important to hear. Um, okay, read and learn from your tests. So comment below and how many of you guys just see your test and either you're so ecstatic about your big score or you're just angry about your low score that you don't even read the test. And for a long time, I was guilty of this where I just like kind of got my score, either I was happy or sad, and then I forgot it. Um, but you can learn a lot if you really study your test. Judges have a really hard job um, because judging is subjective and you know they try to be as objective as possible and they're judging to a standard, but it's really hard to do. Nevertheless, judges are professionals and they go through a lot of training and education and they're not paid very well, but they do have training and they do have a good eye and they do know what they're looking at. So even if you're upset with your score, read the comments, read the scores and learn from it because that's the main reason we're showing and training is to learn. So. I always go through and I look at what comments are repeated over and over again, because that's gonna tell you the biggest thing you need to work on. Is it, you know, your horse isn't forward, your horse isn't on the bit. You know, also look at those, the comments at the end of the test and your, um, your collective marks are really important. Another really interesting thing to look at is to compare your scores on the left and the right. So you'll notice like if all of your scores when you're tracking left, like say your left circles, your left shoulder in, your left lead canter, if that's all higher than on the right, then you need to really work on everything tracking right. So that's an important pattern to pick up on. Um, decide what comments you can improve. So there's some things that you just have to accept. Every horse has strengths and weaknesses. So there's some movements or some comments that it's just like, you just have to accept that you're gonna get a four or a five and you can't do better than that. Um, especially I have you know some students with older horses that can't do a big medium trot anymore, but they have a lot of other good qualities and they can do a nice flying change and a nice half pass and so, I kind of tell my students, look, you know, you have to accept that you're not going to get an eight for your medium trot. Your horse can't get that score. So work on what you can get a good score on, like work on riding really accurately, work on having perfectly square halts. Um, just because you don't have 
a $100,000 horse doesn't mean that you can't ride a very accurate, um, harmonious, nice test and get all the points that you can get where you can get them. Um, then the other thing I always try and do after I get my test is I set a few goals for the next show. So I try and write down and I'll even put a reminder in my phone of what I want to practice for the next show. Um, so the last show that I did, I really realized with Harvey that like our center line and halt was pretty much the worst part of the test. Um, and that was just simply because I hadn't been practicing it enough. And so I wrote a reminder in my phone to remind me every day to just practice my halts. It's just as simple as that. Um, so pick out what your goal is, put a reminder in your phone, or you can put one in your tack box or wherever to just work on that. Um, halts are always something that we forget to work on. And you have two halts in every test. You wanna start off with a good impression to the judge. And halts are also something that, you know, it doesn't matter how fancy of a horse you have, you can make a nice halt and start your test off nicely. Um, Amelia, yes. there's, there's a question here about how do you feel or what do you do when you disagree with the judge? Like you had that judge where the scoring was all low. And the other point is they often take yeah, people are taking their tests to their trainers and reviewing it. What are your thoughts on that? Um, so yes, I definitely reviewing it with your trainer is really important because like I said, your trainer knows you and your horse much better than the judge. The judge is just getting a snapshot view of you and your horse. So it could be that you just had a bad day and it's not normally like that. Your trainer is also much more aware of, like I said, the limitations that you and your horse might have and more able to help you understand like, okay, this we can make better and work on and this we kind of just have to accept and live with for the time being. Um, if you disagree with a judge, it's, it's a little bit hard because you're going to have times that you disagree with a judge and you have to kind of, I, I always think accept that you disagree with them, but then you have to try and learn from them because they are a professional. They do have training. And so even if you feel like maybe they were harsh on you, but there is some validity to what they're saying. So, you know, set it aside and get over being mad about the judge. Set it aside for a few days or a few weeks and then try and go back and watch your test and read the comments and try and understand. Also, you can, um, if, you've, if you're done showing for that judge, you can not ask them to explain their scores to you. But I really advise against being angry or upset or going around and bad mouthing the judge. As hard as that is to do, it's really not productive. And you kind of just have to accept that this is a subjective sport that we ride in. Sometimes you'll see, even in international competitions, there'll be like a 10% spread in um, scoring. And that's just part of the competition. That's part of how it is. So there's also a site you guys can look up called Dressage Detectives. I think that's what it's called. Or yeah, Dressage Detectives, where you can look up the judges and you can see for each judge their median scores. And it's interesting to look at, like some judges just ha score higher than others. Others are low scoring judges. Some are high scoring judges. So that's part of Okay, this is my last, I think my almost last slide. So it's really important in dressage that you compete with yourself. Unfortunately, part of your score is based on the quality of your horse's gates. So if you have a horse that has, is gonna get an eight for their gates, 
you're going to beat someone that has a horse that only has six for their gates. Even if you guys ride equally well and have the same nice test. So because of that, it's really important to always kind of set your standard for you and your horse. And you need to always have that in mind. Like, did you have a better ride than the last show? Were you happy with how you and your horse did? What can you improve? Um, so it's not always about winning. It's really about doing your personal best with you and your horse and not always comparing yourself with someone else. Um, because unfortunately, that's part of what's unfair about dressage is it's just like the person with the best horse has a better chance of winning. Um, I started out when I first started showing, my first horse was Achilles and he was like a quarter horse Arab. And I never won on him, but I learned so much. He was safe. I could get around the show ring. He didn't have the most spectacular gates, but I learned a lot from him. And little by little now I'm getting better quality horses with better gates. All right, guys, thanks so much for watching that lecture. I really hope that you enjoyed it and learned something from it. And again, be sure to check out my master classes that I have available for training level, first level, and second level. The link is down below.